Okay, everybody, welcome to the call. Uh, just give us one more minute to let everybody in. It usually takes a few minutes for everybody to come in. Um, as we can see, the numbers growing fast. Apparently, everybody really wants to talk to Sam today, so that's awesome. And I did a couple commercials for you last night, Sam, and uh, I think you were well received. That's cool. Damn, 86. We're going to have to make sense today. Yeah, and if it's 86 now, it's, we're going to get over 100 today. The last call, right? Officially. Uh, we'll be doing some more, though. Yeah. Expanding this out. As long as the, as long as the country shut down, everybody's at home, we'll keep uh, doing these on a pretty regular basis for a while. Um, let me turn down my game. Myself. Testing, one, two, testing. Does that sound better? A little more pulled back, but a little less echoey. Okay. Well, welcome everybody. Uh, it seems like the bulk of you are in here. I'm sure there'll be a few more people coming in over the next few minutes. Um, we've got, uh, awesome. Thanks guys. Um, we've got Sam Pond here today and I know everybody loves Sam. That's why everybody turned out today. He's, uh, he's got such a big heart and he's so sweet uh, that we all want to listen to Sam. Um, today we're going to be talking about beliefs, but and then we're going to get into beliefs around dating, uh, especially for you guys that have a, a really bad belief system around dating and that are older. Uh, Sam, sixty-four, just turned sixty-four. As a matter of fact, anybody wish him a happy birthday yet? Everybody, give him that. Send him some love on the uh, chat box here, and, and uh, Sam can take a look at it. But he just turned sixty-four. Uh, Sam's life's only been getting better and better. I remember Sam at 62 was saying it was the best year of his life and 63 was only better. And I'm expecting 64 to get better for him. And, uh, he's killing it. He's got an amazing dating life, a dating life that guys in their twenties could only dream about. Uh, he doesn't seem, uh, like a man in his, what we would think a man in his 60s should seem like, because I, I run into guys in their thirties all the time that seem so much older than Sam. They, they act old, they, they run around and... <laughs> So you got to get, got a geezer in there, buddy. Um, I, I call him young man because, you know, I'm getting older too and I'm not a geezer. <laughs> so to me, he's a, he's a nice young man, but, uh, but Sam's killing it, you know, and his life only gets better and better. You know, he, for those of you that want to date younger women, he's dating younger women, but uh, I know he's not opposed to dating women that are older too, as long as they have a, they're young at heart like him. And that's the piece. When you're young at heart, you want somebody young at heart that's full of life, that's full of passion, that's out there doing it. So we're going to be talking about belief systems, how to change your belief systems in general, and then we're going to relate it specifically to dating, or he is, a dating sex sexuality. Now, I've seen Sam change radically over the years, and I've talked about this before. The amount he changed in a short period of time is nothing short of spectacular. So really listen to what he has to say. He's also very much in touch with his heart, and, and that's the key to fast change. When you get in touch with your heart, your heart is a transmuting factor for all your limiting beliefs. And when your limiting beliefs get transmuted by, your, by an open heart, then the rest of your body just starts to fall in line. And, and I'm not talking about just beliefs that are like feelings that are stuck in the heart. It could be stuck in the pelvis. It could be stuck in the stomach. But the heart is, is the big piece of the transmuting factor. Um, so uh, did you see all those happy birthdays, Sam? Yeah, I'm basking in them. I'm you got a I love the beard from Orr. Orr is sending you some. Yeah, man. Yeah. My lockdown beard. Maybe I'll keep it going. Mm -hmm. I think you should grow it out really long and be the wise man. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Orr. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, buddy. Take it away, mate. Uh, let's, let's hear about some uh, how, how you're transmuting beliefs these days. Well, you know, that makes me think about when I uh, first started, you know, working with you guys and how many um, beliefs that uh, I was really encumbered by a lot of abusive thoughts. And they were so, I described it as baked in. They were just, I didn't even see them. I didn't see the, uh, I mean, they told me all kinds of things from, um, you know, what I looked like and, and how I acted and uh a lot of shoulds and you got to work harder and you should and you're behind. Oh my God. It's like they were, they were endless. And um, once I started getting into, you know, my body and really feeling my feet on the ground and how to open myself and start to feel, uh, they were still, in fact, it, it was interesting. They actually got stronger uh, for a while because I was feeling so much more. They were having a, 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 like, and, 
and they were they were being revealed to me as uh, outside of me, but they still seemed very real because the emotions and the stories were like were locked into each other, and they were like very gluey. So um, I just kept showing up for workshops and uh, and uh, and in a container call. These container calls, by the way, are the different separate kind of workshop where we uh, help guys. Um, with accountability over like a three or six month period. So I was doing mine on the way up to the dating week long in Bucharest. And I swear, and where Josh is on the call, Josh is constantly hammering, just showing me the negative thought, showing me the negative thought, showing me the negative thought. And I thought, well, am I just built of negative thinking? And it uh, finally came to a point where Josh just said, Sam, every negative thought you have in your head is a lie. And finally, that was the last thing that, that really struck me. It's like, wow, they're all lies. And suddenly they started to loosen. You know, I, it's funny. I grabbed this coming up, but I wasn't sure why. And now I know exactly why, because I kind of related to the call. But as a man thinketh is exactly, puts a light on exactly what you're talking about. A tiny little book uh, written in the early 1900s, I think like 1903 or something like that. And it's such a powerful piece of work because it, it, it does exactly what Josh did to you. It describes that. And, um, and I don't know if you've read it, but, um, it just showed up yesterday. I just ordered it and it showed up yesterday. It's sitting over in my bed. So it's a classic to be read over and over, to be honest, but it is all about your thinking and how your thinking creates your reality. And it has, it has these, you know, from the early 1900s versions, the descriptions, of what people think like that they have horrible lives and it goes through this is the, the the you know basically the bad thinker he doesn't say it that way and this is and when you get control of these thoughts and you can't control the thoughts you got to you got to change the emotions that drive the thoughts but when you get control of both of those your whole reality starts to shift and we give a lot of techniques to help you get control of both those that's what we do but just reading this puts a a really good light on how you think now you got to remember it's it's written in that old early 1900s English. So, uh, you know, for some of you that might be, you might not be able to, it may, I like that because it forces you to take your time with it and really sit with what he's saying. But um, yeah, you know, thoughts are really, our personal thinking is so powerful. It's the thoughts that we choose can be very, thoughts that we choose can be very powerful. They can start to build a life and build what you want out of life. The thoughts that you don't choose, those are all lies. They, those all came from someplace else. Your past, you know. Yeah. I was reading in uh, God Works Through You uh, last night. I've read it several nights in a row, the same chapter, the same section where it just says, um, you know, the law of cause and effect is a, is a, is a law that works 100% of the time. It's what they call karma in, the, in Buddhism and stuff like that. And um, the law of cause and effect is that's what makes it so beautiful and you are you will suffer from the law of cause and effect as long as you are a prisoner to your past it the pa unresolved past cause and effect will just keep recreating situations to force you to face it but once you're free of your unresolved past you can use the law of cause and effect to create the most beautiful reality uh, humans can imagine and um and that's a powerful thought and uh it's a powerful come from yeah, think of all the brainwashing that we've been through. I mean, I, I talked about this before, but the birth of the ego uh, started with language. If, from the moment you were born, someone started telling you who you are and what to believe. From the moment that you know you popped out of your mom and the doctor said, oh, he's loud. Now you're loud. And that's where it starts. And along the way, whether it's your parents or your church or your society or culture or whatever, starts to plant these little seeds of what they perceive your reality is. And that becomes the ego. So um, animals don't have this. Animals are natural, except for dogs. Dogs tend to take on the neuroses of their owners. I think any animal that lives that close to a human uh, can take on neuroses. <laughs> Yeah, yeah I, th I think it happens to horses too. Uh, when they, but when they live in nature, they don't do it. You know? No, yeah. And you think of the of the things that have been told to you. Any negative thing that was spoken to you was spoken with a certain emotional energy. Like no one ever said, "You're worthless." With love, 
worthless came from their shame and their, so you, it's like you got an injection of not just the thought, but of their emotion too. So they come in uh, uh, with, uh, with pain. Mm -hmm. I read a beautiful thing from Mickey Singer uh, about uh, just the other night about how these things come into us with pain. And so to release them, there's going to be a little pain. They go in with pain and they go out with pain, but the going out pain is your uh, salvation, is your enlightenment. I thought that was the coolest thing. Nice. So you welcome the second pain as it leaves your body. That was really cool. It's beautiful. I think we're going to have to have a podcast series once we get the podcast studio set up. It's going to be in this room and we're going to have it all designed out. Um, and I think uh, Deep Thoughts with Sam would be a good podcast series where, where we sit down and have these deep discussions about philosophical shit in life. And, yeah, right. and, uh, and, and not, not to get depressed, to get to, to open us up, you know. Right. Like, yeah, yeah. And not to get us more deeply into our heads. Uh, yeah. So guys, if you want a podcast series like that, yeah, let us know. Put it in the chat. That would be fun. Yeah. Um, hey, let me read something really quick. I want to hear what I, I just, I've, I, this is the first uh, paragraph in the chapter on thought and character, which is the first chapter in As a Man Thinketh. Um, the, aphor the aphorism, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Not only in, embraces the whole of the man's being, but is so comprehensive as to reach out to every condition and circumstance of his life. A man is literally what he thinks. His character being the uh, his character being the complete sum of all thoughts. His character being the complete sum of all thoughts. Think about that. What is your life like? And whatever it you are seeing in the physical world represents the complete sum of all your thoughts. It's a powerful realization when you think about it. Wow. Yeah. And those, uh, yeah, I get that. You know, I was thinking about, um, I was uh, a year or two ago, I was taking a bunch of guys, I was experimenting with guys about, can they come up with one thought that brings them peace and acceptance and love? It was really interesting because everybody tried to say, um, okay, what is the true thought that fills me with peace? I am courageous and then the question is did you believe that and i go well no but i want to be courageous and so we whittled and, and everybody came up with the same thought that fills them with peace a version of the same thought fills them with peace and uh and love and uh one really great one he's a, a i mean maybe on the call he's a friend of fearless he was very frustrated he said okay i'm not a sex god and i'm not i'm, I'm not filled with courage and peace and all these affirmations and finally, he just gave up and said, okay, I just am. I'm just here. And in that moment, there was this stillness as we were talking. And I said, and he said, do you, do you feel that? I said, yeah. And he said, everything is more sparkly. He found a thought which, which was so true. I'm just here. And he had a moment of like this uh, total relaxation and the world started to shimmer. That's what he used the word shimmer. I thought that was the coolest thing. Just here. That's beautiful. Which is, I guess what, uh, you know, that's what we do with, with meditation is to clear our minds and to be here. But sometimes it's just, uh, it's just a thought away. I'm just here. Everybody can think I'm just here. A kind of uh, simplicity. Uh, Brian and I, you and I were talking about the three principles of the, um, uh, that, that thought system uh, behind the works of Sidney Banks. Uh, everybody look up Sidney Banks, he's a beautiful speaker. And he talks, and they believe there's universal mind, and there's universal consciousness, and there's universal thought. And that they, this school of thinking thinks that our entire reality are based on our thinking. Also, as well as our emotional state. If you are thinking, I'm worthless, you're going to have an emotional uh, reaction to that thought. Now, 
I don't know, this is a chicken or the egg thing, right? Uh, I don't know if uh, maybe you have, uh, you feel worthless because you have shame inside of your body. So it goes back and forth. But most, power, the, most teachers will say it starts with thought and then you create the emotion. And I've played with that myself and I call it chicken and egg too. Um, because when you dig back, I see emotions create new thoughts all the time and then thoughts create more emotions and they just, they, they, they instantly manifest together in time. Yeah. So then you go back to the Descartes saying, I think, therefore I am. Well, we talked about that. I, I suppose I am, I therefore I think. <laughs> the uh, universal mind stuff is powerful because in reality, we know from deep meditation, from getting people in a coma state of hypnosis, when you surrender the ego, even if it's just temporarily by going into a deep trance state, you go right into bliss. Um, mm -hmm. And you are built, your core energy is bliss, peace, love. Any emotion that's heavier than that is, is a program running in your body created by, and it's, it's, in, it's synchronistic to a thought. And the thought and the program are working together to create that experience. That doesn't mean it's bad. That's how we create in the physical world. You know, that's how we have experiences and contrast and we create all these colors of being a physical human being. But at your core, you're powered and by this peace and love, even the darkest individual who is so removed from that peace and love, that's why they're dark at their core, their peace and love. And that's, that's my firm belief. Um, and I think it's a powerful one when you think about it. And I just wish every, I think my friend described a good friend of mine who's a teacher, he described uh, realization is very different than enlightenment to him. And he said the realization is the experience of that deep state of peace and love, even if it's just for a moment, realizing there's so much more behind this ego. Doesn't mean you're living in it, but you've realized it, you've experienced it. And enlightenment is living in it. I just want to see what you thought about that. Yeah, um, it's really hard for us to grasp that our natural state is of, is of peace and acceptance. From, from, our, from our thinking and our ego, it's really hard to grasp that. But it's like what we talked about in that last call. When I do a meditation on observance of my thinking, then I realize I'm not my thoughts. And when I become aware of my own awareness, that's when my whole body just drops into deep relaxation. It feels like love. Makes total sense. And that's exactly it. That's why people didn't want to come out of the coma state of hypnosis back when they would get put into it. Um, they would be told by the hypnotist to come out and they wouldn't come out because they just felt so good. They didn't want to leave it. Yeah. So they yeah. Had well, I was at uh, one of those chanting meditations, uh, Kir Kiritan, and uh, everybody, I got there and I thought, I don't like being here. <laughs> more, more stories of Sam showing up at spiritual events and not being comfortable because everybody was floating. The music was playing and they were doing this, I'll do this impersonation, they were just doing this chanting and doing this in their heads and I thought, the reason I'm not comfortable is that they're disassociating from their bodies, they're disassociating from this kind of reality. I just, and they seemed to be enjoying themselves, but I, I didn't feel there was any groundedness in the room. It was like a floating, floating, floating that wasn't really addressing anything. I don't know. Maybe it's just my own perspective on it. Oh, I know. I agree with you 100%. That grounding energy is, is just as spiritual as your upper energy. The lower and the upper, I mean, either everything is spiritual or nothing is spiritual at the deepest level. Everything is created for your growth and for your experience, even to apathy and depression. So when you realize that, you go, that's when you go free. And the most spiritual people are actually the most grounded, connected, open. These floating people are trying to. Re, uh, reject the lower energy and accept the higher energy. And in that they're stuck. They're constantly battling between these bliss states of the higher energy. Yeah. They believe in the bliss states and, and consciousness. They experience it. They have realizations of it, but then they also experience uh, attachment to pain because they're avoiding it. The aversion to the pain is an attachment. And so they're bouncing between these two. And that's why they seem a lot of times so dysfunctional. Um, true spiritual people should have a grounded, practical, functional in my opinion quality to them when they're integrated doesn't mean you can't i'm not saying that even those people are, are beautiful spiritual people at the deepest level and even the angry people are but 
if you really want a truly functional life, see all of it as spiritual. Wow. Yeah, because we are already spiritual. In fact, by I don't like to call myself a, I'm spiritual because there's a certain pride that keeps us from actually being spiritual. <laughs> My description of myself is I'm spiritually curious. Okay, if I'm just curious, I'm then... spiritual, Sam. You're bad. <laughs> Wrong. <laughs> no, I, I, I am the deepest, most spiritual person on earth. That's how spiritual I am. <laughs> I just see it all the time. Uh, do you do you want me to keep jumping in with you? I love sure. it. Oh yeah, no, I I like this conversation. Very yeah. good. I didn't know if you had a specific talk you wanted to give or anything like that. So it's awesome. No, it's fun. Sometime we should talk about dating, but uh, this is a good foundation for it. You can talk about the dating and and also the spiritual part of it. How much has you grown spiritually from dating? You know. Oh. Geez, that's a great question because it's, it's, it's everything. When I, you know, before I got started getting involved in fields and all the things I learned along the way, all very powerful, but especially the spiritual stuff, I was looking to uh, feel better. I was looking to heal myself. And it wasn't until I started really dropping into my own, like, physical reality, my own embodied reality, that all of a sudden, that groundedness allowed a lot of understanding to to uh, to open to open up, and it was. I mean, I just like most guys, I come to fearless because I didn't understand women, how I was with women, but there was a clue in there. There was something in there that this was going to be the key for me to unlock something. So it was my desire to, for you know to have better sex, to have better connection, to have, be able to show up in front of a woman and say, hi, I like you, I'm here and you're here. So, and that was my spirit, that's in a way, it's my spiritual path. Yeah. And that's what I look at, it's all your part of your spiritual path. Even the darkest day you've had in your life is ultimately part of your spiritual growth. And that contrast, Abraham Hicks talks about this a lot, it's in that contrast of having experienced such pain that you can really understand the beauty and the consciousness of, of, of peace and love. And uh, a lot of what we come here for is to experience that contrast, not to get stuck in it, but to experience it. And, and I've experienced, and I know you have too, sadness being beautiful, even apathy being beautiful when you're no longer attached or averse to it and you see it and then you're suddenly, Oh, it's just thicker energy. You know, I can, I can, I can be with that. And then it doesn't last very long. It's like a, like a cloudy day is beautiful or watching it. Sometimes I love being caught in a snowstorm up in the mountains and watching it come down and you can't even see. It's like, it's just this beautiful power of nature and, and this craziness. And then after it's all over, there's this light, fluffy, beautiful snow everywhere. And you can't have that light, fluffy, beautiful snow and, and powder days where you go skiing and deep powder up to your waist if you don't have those storms. And so those storms are just like, yeah, what's coming next? This is going to be awesome. And and I've, I, have, I have spent so much time in the wilderness backpacking and, and climbing. And, and to me, the best nights are in a tent with a monstrous thunderstorm piling up and shaking things. It's just, it's exciting. And you know that it's going to be over. And then when you wake up, it's going to be just, just everything is cleaned out. Yeah, I love that. I love getting caught in a thunderstorm up in the mountains. And everybody wants it to be 80 degrees and sunny all the time. I'm like, oh, hey, it's all about contrast. Yeah. yeah. How many days in a row could you do that? At first, it's great, but how many days in a row could you do that before you're like, Jesus Christ, I want something different? Yeah, it's like living in LA, Brian. Exactly. That's, you know, I didn't really understand bad weather. Like I say, LA's got bad weather. It rains once in a while. And, and then I went, you know, back east, I start traveling the world, and I was like, "Whoa, LA does not have bad weather." You know, it's just, it just it just doesn't happen here. Yeah, yeah, liberation from thinking—that's what. And they, you know, that was one of the other things I, I thought part way through of my journey with you guys was that, okay, I'm in my sixties. Uh, it was happened like the first year. Maybe the fact that I've I. Like I, I'm different than the guys in their twenties and thirties because they haven't collected decades of stories 
which I have to deal with. So how am I going to unravel all of these stories and beliefs I, I didn't see or bad habits or uh, it was really, it was a struggle. It was my own personal struggle. So I realized there's no difference between a man who has five stories and another man who has a hundred stories. Uh, what's underneath them, then you can be free. You just nailed it. And that's what everybody, I try to explain that very concept to people. And you don't have to fix your ego. You just have to disassociate from it. And, and, and you don't make it good or bad, but I guess disassociate is a bad way to say it. You have to stop being attached or averse to it. So you can see the ego as a thing that allows you to function in the world. But then there's the spiritual you and I'm more identified with the spiritual me. Yeah, I have a personality. It has some quirks. It has some like stuff and I'll be working on that the rest of my life. Because you think about it, if you drop the ego altogether, what are you going to do? Sit there in bliss all day and just not move? No. That's, what's gonna happen. That's what happens to teachers all the time, right? When they get to that, they reach that pinnacle state, Eckhart Tolle, uh, Lester Levinson, they end up sitting there in bliss state, not wanting to move and just like, oh, everything's beautiful. Well, maybe that's good for them. <laughs> I like Abraham Hicks I a lot. And I dived into Abraham Hicks and uh, uh, last year and Law of Attraction, and she called it contrast. She said, these things only pop up for contrast of how you really want to feel or that other side. So if something negative happens or a belief system pops up or a lower, heavier emotion, they're just there. And I realized, oh, they're just rumble strips. And then I begin to see anything negative as just rumble strips that I'm off. I've just started to drift. So they just, they're just awakenings. Rumble strips. That's a good, that's good. It's good. Yeah. Catchy. It's catchy. Yeah. I'm going to write that. Down. Abraham Hicks is good at these catchy little terms and phrases. It's just, yeah. ah, I like that. You know? Yeah. So I hooked into that. So a lot of guys, I mean, I work with a lot of guys who are, who are older and, Oh my God. But see, the thing is, Brian, is that when I'm 64 and when I was in my twenties or thirties, there was no information at all about anything. And so we were just doing our best with what we knew, which was our close friends and maybe a book. And so, and so guys who are older have gone through quite a bit of time where there is no fearless. There is no YouTube videos. There is no, gurus were farther away than they are now. So consider yourself blessed in a, in a, in a time of, uh, of access. And gurus is an interesting thing because a lot of gurus, uh, you couldn't really figure out if they really knew what they were talking about or not because there wasn't enough contrast to see the level of consciousness. Because a lot of people are good talkers and they can get a giant following by being a good talker, they have really good positive inception, the ability to transfer emotion and turn on, but doesn't necessarily mean they have the, they're set helping to set you free. I, I lived in a cult for a year. Um, it was a very interesting experience. I didn't ever trust the guru, but it was fascinating to watch. And it was fascinating to watch. And the, the thing I noticed about that year in that cult was I didn't see people getting more conscious. I saw people getting less conscious. And I think that was an intentional, um, mm. very destructive. And the only reason it didn't bother me, and I had another teacher who was really, I loved uh, Sheikh Salik. Salik told me, he goes, the reason you seem to thrive in this environment is because you're really discerning. You can look at everything and say, that works, that doesn't, that works. And I would, I literally, that's what I was doing. I was sitting there for that year because it fascinated me to learn from these people. And, and I was also being helpful to people, you know, I was like in a healing clinic and I was doing, I was trying to help that, uh, the general public and I saw it as a lot of good too. But uh, boy, that was one educational year. The craziness that went on in there. You would, I've always sweared I was gonna, swore I was going to make a sitcom out of it. Because it just it was one crazy story after every day you wake up and you're like, is this real? Or, it's crazy. Yeah, misunderstandings of the world when they're, not, when they're used to manipulate people are bad. But when they're used to entertain people in comedy, which is comedy is nothing but misunderstandings, they're funny. Because <laughs> nobody dies. Nobody the whole of them. Huh? Yeah. So I had, I'm looking at some of the comments here. Um, uh, I had a thought, because we were talking about the self limiting beliefs. And I talked about it on some webinar about how my experience with when I see an attractive woman and I have an, a, 
and I consider talking to her, I have a what I call the, the freeway car pileup crash that's in my head of a dozen thoughts all colliding at the same time. Uh, and, I have, and I have my go-tos. But I'm really curious to the guys in the chat, if you see a woman, what's the first thought that comes into your mind when you think about approaching her? I'd be really curious. Boobs. Okay, that's funny. Shame isn't a thought, Nathan. She thought, oh no, fuck, I shouldn't. Maybe she's busy. That's a, that's a, that's, yeah. I'm boring. I can't. Ooh, these are flying in. I don't want to bother her. I'm going to latch on. Yeah, I don't want to bother her. This is a really, this is one of the most common. Don't you think, Brian, I'd be bothering her? Oh, it's super common. Um, I'm curious. I haven't seen anybody write it yet, but um, I'm going to get, uh, does anybody think they're going to get yelled at or get arrested? I used to get people that would say that to me. I'm going to get arrested if I go bother her. And, you know, and I also haven't seen creepy, which was another one I've seen a lot of. Yeah, the arrested one show, has shown up um, you know, when we were in the thick of the Me Too movement, when it was height and it's height in the media. One guy said to me as we were walking, he said, Sam, you, you understand that we could get arrested for talking to women in public. And I had to pull off to the side and unravel the media. He's just been, he was just watching too much TV and it was latching on to his shame. So now his shame latched on with the media story and it just shut him down to believing that he could actually get arrested. I, I just, you know, it, think about that. Think of that. Imagine a cop pulling you aside and saying, yes, you were talking to that girl. You told her you liked her. I have to take you to jail. You know, that's, you're not allowed to do that. You're not allowed to talk to other people on the street. It's, 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 here's a, it's crazy. Well, and what's cr even crazier is that it was real in his head. Yeah. The thought, if you don't have any shame, the thought you could get arrested for talking to a girl in public would just seem silly. But if you have a lot of shame, ooh, that actually becomes a really good excuse for not talking to a girl. Oh, see, I get arrested. I'm off the hook. I can keep hiding. It's, 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 it's crazy realization when you sit with it. Yeah. And, uh, but people do believe it. And, and there are some countries where there, that might actually be true. So what did he happen to be from one of those countries or have any heritage from one of those countries? Uh, Indian guy. So he uh, did, did carry some uh, cultural stuff about being openly sexual in public. So Interesting. Yeah, there's some countries where you literally could get in serious trouble if you don't follow all the real cultural rules. But they're, they're in the minority, you know. They're on the streets of San Francisco, so. Yeah, yeah, that's completely different. Uh, I had two guys, I was walking with two Indian guys uh, who were in tech in San Francisco and we were walking around practicing some social freedom and they pulled me aside and said, Sam, you do know this is a very bad idea for two Indian men to walk together in public talking to girls. I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> what are you talking about? So I had to sit and they had a lot of stories because the main story was the shame of in the American culture of being Indian and, uh, and all that. So we had to unravel that because it had nothing to do with the true belief of their belief of two guys, two Indian guys. That's fascinating. And that's so, it's so strong. The Indian cultures, I've really seen this deep embedded Indian Asian cultures where we have to do a lot of untying in this area and, um, and get them in touch with their emotions. And they also tend towards that logical mind that doesn't serve them so much. It's, it's powerful. Um, you've seen that, I'm sure, too. I mean, we've, we've, we work with a lot of the same people. Um, I, there was this one guy I worked with, though. He was interesting. Um, and he had an interesting reaction and I was walking down the street with him and I was saying, just say hi to people walking down the street. Let's do that. Let's do a hundred highs. Let's just say hi to this person and that person. And he was like, I can't do that. I can't do that. And I'm like, I'll demonstrate. So I start walking down the street and I'm waving to people. Hey, what's up? How you doing? Have a beautiful day. How you doing? And I'm walking and I see these two black women talking to each other and they look sweet. 
And then right behind him was this, uh, and this guy that I was teaching was a big guy too. He, he was a white guy. He, right behind him was this big black guy walking kind of with him. And as I go by, I go, hey, what's up? How you guys doing? And I said hi to them. And then as he walked by, because he was a little behind him, I was like, hey, how you doing? And he was freaking out, losing his mind behind me. And I was like, what are you doing? What's it? He's like shaking and nervous. And I said, what's going on with you? And he goes, um, I swore you were going to get your ass kicked by that big black guy for talking to his women. And I was like, really? Didn't even, I didn't even enter my mind. These ridiculous yeah. beliefs that we pick up from society somewhere, you know, and it's crazy to me. Well, that's a great thing to test because if you, because I had the same experience on third street, in fact, I was demonstrating and I stopped the big, I said hi to a big group of, uh, of uh, black people, men and women. And uh, I felt my own stories coming up, but I threw them out. And you know what, what reality is? Reality is 10 people are going, damn, how you doing? Why'd you stop us? Why'd you talk to us? We're black, you're white. And we had this great, great moment. Uh, so it's the outside world, I keep saying this over and over, the outside world is far kinder to us than our inside world. Oh, that's a powerful statement. Everybody should write that down. The outside world is far kinder. It plays out over and over and over again. Yeah. Now, do you find that that's true? Because a lot of times the outside world is a projection or a response to your inside world. So you have this response where you see the outside world as kinder than, than your own beliefs. There are some people out there that I literally believe that have a really rough outside world. Not that the, literally the world outside is, is rough. It's that they believe it that the outside world is rough so much that they, through anger, through resentment, they're calling these attacks to them. They're getting people to attack them and they don't even see it. Do you have that experience? Yeah. Like my friend who was uh, terrified of being conned or swindled. So whenever he travels, he attracts con men and swindlers, which reinforces his belief system, which draws more con men and swindlers to him. So well, maybe I, maybe because it is a little Pollyannish to believe that uh, that the outside world is kind of the inside world, but is the potential for it to always be kind? I don't think it's Pollyanna. I think that's the way it is, and I think people create the opposite. Yeah, I think that literally, if you are free of your and you have enough ego to have a good, uh, to have your life function, but not enough, not so much ego that you have a million fixed beliefs to deal with, then the outside world becomes a giving. Hawkins talks about this, you know, when you're down in apathy, grief and fear, the outside world seems like a stingy parent that doesn't want to give you love and doesn't want to give you what you want in the, and encourage acceptance, love and peace. When you live up there, the outside world seems utterly giving all the time and sweet and, and caring. Maybe the difference is Brian is that if we are open to testing it out, testing out the, the outside world, then it would start to reveal its kindness. If we are stuck in, in our own swirl of, uh, of shame or anger or sadness, then we're going to keep seeing that until you actually test it out and say, what if I go out and test the world and see what happens? That's when the world starts to open up to you. Now, do you think that I would think, and you tell me your thoughts on this, that if I went out and started testing the outside world and I'm stuck down in apathy, grief, and fear, I'm probably not going to get the best responses at first. Probably not. Yeah. And then I'm going to swear the outside world is abusive because look, look how it's responding to me. Well, then you just need to pick, pick, a, prick the skin of that just a little bit and say, I wonder if the world is kinder than my inside world. Yeah. I would agree with her. That would start to open things up. But if you come in with a fixed thing, nobody wants to talk to me. Hi. See, I told you. See, so yeah, now I would, when I was stuck down there, what I would do, and this helped me a lot, and I didn't realize I was doing it, it was an unconscious act. I would start hanging out with people that got a better response. And then I would I'd watch them and spend a lot of time with them. And I'd see how the world treats them different. And my first perceptions were, well, there's something wrong with me because they treat him good. and they, It's got to be looks. It's got to be something else. It's, with time, I began to tear that apart. And I think that was an unconscious process in the beginning. I like that. And, but by surrounding myself with people of higher vibration, eventually you start climbing up that ladder because you, you just, you just see your beliefs get shattered one after another. When you're around these people, you start like, well, I swore that was true, but look what he just did. 
you know. Um, Do you remember we had a guy in, uh, it was an experience who showed up with uh, a tactical flashlight because he was worried that doing the field work was going to be dangerous. And he showed it and he says, here it is. Wow. And it's got, you can use it as a tack, you can blind somebody with it. And he learned that the world, he did not first, he realized he didn't need to use his tactical flashlight because he wasn't actually being attacked on the Third Street Promenade. And then slowly he, and I think he eventually left it behind one day as the world slowly revealed itself as kind. And, and that was probably a huge step for him. I mean, as crazy as that sounds, that was a serious step for him to leave that behind. That was the, that was the leaving behind of a major belief system. Yeah. Yeah. Did you encourage him to do that or did he just do it? I don't remember. No, I don't think it showed up on the third day. It just wasn't around. So. Wow. That's on the hip pocket. I love hearing these stories because, you know, we've been doing this for so many years and I still, there's so many people that you guys help, you know, that I've trained you guys and then they, and that I don't get to see. And, and even you guys, you guys tell me these stories and I'm like, you've never told me that before. This is so great. And it's just, it warms my favorite story. My favorite story is a guy who I followed into, uh, he was really struggling and he had one of those disappearing moments where it's really great when you're walking with a guy and he disappears and you know, he disappeared to go talk to a girl. He just had that feeling like he just vanished. So I'm looking around, where did he go? And I saw him in the side of a store talking to a blonde girl. So I'd look through the store windows and he's having, and she is engaged with him and he's talking and he's nervous, but he's talking and he comes out and I, uh, I offer him, you know, a fist to like way to go. And he goes, no, 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 damn it. I said, what's wrong? He said, I didn't get her phone number. I said, okay, well, let me just make you a little awareness that you're, you did something courageous and beautiful and she appreciated it. And now you're kicking your own ass. He goes, yeah, you're right. God damn it, I'm kicking my ass again. <laughs> I said, well, now you're kicking your ass for kicking your ass. When is it going to stop? <laughs> and then he say, damn it, you're right. Damn it, you're right. I'm kicking my ass for kicking my ass for kicking my ass. Yeah. And it was a habit. It was a habit of thought. It was a habit of how it, he'd been carrying this self-abuse for, for his whole life. And then it finally <laughs> shined some light on it. So. Yeah. Well, let's, let's that, that's a really good segue. Let's talk about dating yeah. in general with beliefs. Let's really focus on that for a minute. And, and um, men um, that are older or men that think they're older, like some of you guys, how many of you guys out there think, oh, I should, you know, she's too young for me. And you're like in your thirties or forties and I can't date that girl or, or one of you wrote that I really like to date older women. And is that wrong or bad? You know, how many of you have these kind of beliefs about age? Yep, I'm 39. By the way, that story is really, if you guys are in your 20s and you have it, you know, fess up. There's 29. I feel bad at hitting, uh, I had a 21-year-old. It's, uh, that's so great. When I was 29, I thought I was, I was, life was over. Yeah, so did I. And my, when I hit 30, I thought I was over the hill. Now yeah. I feel younger than when I was 30. Yeah. Um, by the way, um, while this is up, I'm going to share with you guys a, um, I have a, a Facebook group uh, for dating beyond your 30s. So here, I'll just put it in the end. That's this one from Nathan here, too. Um, I know there's BS, but they still come up, especially online. Women complain that guys in their 50s and 60s are hitting on them. Sorry, what was that again, Brian? I missed that. Nathan saying that that uh, their stories. He thinks they're stories, but he believes it online. Well, he says online women complain that guys in their fifties and sixties hit on them. Who, I'm sorry. Who complains? Women. Yeah. Women well, complain the guys in their fifties and sixties are hitting on them online, and they don't want that. Well, that is what simply what they don't want. I mean, we don't have any say over what other people want. It's like, it's, it's, um, it's, we've talked about before, if you are an older man wanting to date a younger woman, and that can be, which is kind of, which is natural, I suppose, um, that most young women, that younger women, 20s or 30s, whatever, 
when asked, are you uh, open to dating an older man? Across the board, they'll say, yeah, open. Now that doesn't mean every young, younger woman wants to date you or the, every single younger woman wants to date, wants to date an older man. Some have, they want a guy to introduce to their parents. They want to get married. They want to have kids. They want, everybody's different. But the story that you are, by virtue of the fact that you're older and you express interest, um, that there's, it's, uh, the, it, the only thing that's holding you back is the shame is the shame of that you're carrying about that story. Because there is, not only is there nothing wrong with dating younger women, the younger women are open to it. Now, whether they're open to you and what you're offering, that's an entirely different thing. And we've talked about this, Brian. If you think, oh, I'm creepy, this is creepy for a man to approach a younger woman and talk to her. When you do, that's the recipe for creepiness. Oh, very much so. I've seen girls complain in their 20s that a guy in his 30s was too old. And, and the guy felt old when I talked to him. I'm like, well, you feel yeah. old. And then a guy like me will walk up and the girls won't say anything. And I'm way older than this guy or you or, and I've seen this time and time again. Um, there are a lot of women I run into that prefer older men. And one of the things I've experienced, and you tell me this, if you, just, if you ever had a woman you start dating, hanging out with, say, you're too old for me. All right, now you're too old. I, I just don't get it. I, 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 I was really terrified in my 30s when I told this one girl in her 20s my age and I was freaking out inside. And, and then I said, you know what? I'm going to stop this freak out. I'm just going to start saying it to every girl. I'm not even, I'm not even going to do like what David D'Angelo used to say is I'm, uh, try to avoid telling her your age, tease her, joke with her. Instead, I just, this is my age. And what ended up happening was interesting. They were like, okay, no big deal. Oh, I like older men. These are the responses that I started getting on a regular basis. If they like you, they like your age. And I don't know, can you respond to that? I have the same experience. Um, they, I was told once by, uh, it was Johnny Soprano, he had a very funny reaction if a woman asked your age, is to say, I don't know, I was raised by wolves. Now, that's a wonderful, it's a, it's a funny thing to say, but you're still, you only would say it if you're hiding something. Um, so when you've got to be comfortable saying your, your age, and if you are comfortable with it, if you are comfortable with where you are in life, uh, and we use, you tell her how old you are, and it will just, like you said, it will just go, oh, okay. I was self-conscious because uh, I've been growing this beard out during the lockdown and, uh, and I saw one of the girls I'm seeing and I, I, and she didn't say anything about my beard. And I had a story like, Oh, this is making me look older. Is that good? Should I look older? And then she told me, she goes, no, I think it's fucking sexy. I went, oh, wow. I was just putting a thought into you that wasn't even your thought. I remember Johnny uh, Soporno's uh, girlfriend, Violet, uh, was, this was like four or five years ago, I asked her about, about this, uh, you know, especially around the, I'd be bothering her uh, thought, whatever the limiting thought is that you have, oh, she's busy, oh, I'm going to be bothering her, oh, she wouldn't like someone like me. And when I asked Violet about this, she said, she got upset, it was really cool. She goes, how dare you or any other man Decide for me what I'm thinking. That's so true. How dare you? That's so selfish. It's so, and I thought, oh my God, that's so true. Test out the world. Mm -hmm. See if it's true that you're bothering her. You know, the only reason they're not <laughs> testing out the world is because they're afraid of rejection. I mean, in sales, let's say you got to get nine, nine no's to get a yes. And that's, that's the given statistic in your business. 90% of people are going to reject you for various reasons. But those yeses, if you get really good at it, you'll have tons of, uh, of sales. Yeah. And that's why the guy would carry the 10 marbles in his pocket and transfer one for every no. In mm. dating, we go out. And the first girl that rejects us, see I'm a piece of shit. Oh, two reject me. I'm a real piece of shit. Oh my God. Five girls have, have 
you know, they were nice. They were sweet. They didn't say anything bad, but they didn't go on a date with me. So I must be a piece of shit. Matter of fact, I don't get girls that blatantly really reject me much anymore. That's pretty rare. They're usually very sweet and nice and they're, un they're unavailable. They're, they're married or something like that. Right. But, um, that's huge. You know, when you think about it, how easily guys take a woman's opinion of them that they don't know personal. That's a major self-esteem flaw right there. Do you think of yourself as a box of cereal on the cereal aisle? That and a woman walks down and all the cereal boxes are waving at the girl and she and you're Honey Nut Cheerios and she picks Raisin Bran. She didn't reject that it's Honey Nut Cheerios. She didn't reject it. She just prefers something else. I don't get re rejections very rare. I remember the first, uh, I knew I was really getting free when I talked to this woman having lunch and I said something. She didn't even look up and she just gave me the back of her hand. And I started laughing because not only did she, she knew, she didn't even see me. She didn't even take me in in any way. And she just flatly gave me the back of her hand, go, the way, go away. And I realized, oh, I can't, I don't have to take anything personally. You can't. You can't take it personal. It doesn't mean anything about you. How many people have you, as men out there, literally rejected coldly because you wanted to get rid of them for some reason? Whether that was an unattractive woman at the bar trying to flirt with you. I mean, think about it. You 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 go out to the bar and you're and you're flirting with this girl. You're trying to get to this girl. Maybe some unattractive girl comes up that you don't, and you you want to get away from her because you think she's bringing down your value, which is bullshit. And so mm -hmm. guys will whole, wholeheartedly be rude to that girl to get away from her. Or how about a salesman that calls you? Or how about, we do it all the time. Women are getting rejected all the time too, you know, for different reasons. Um, and they know it. They know they get rejected by solid guys a lot. Solid guys get picky because they have they know how to get women. Mm -hmm. So yeah, maybe they can get a, a million beta males following them around. I hate that term beta male too, but these million insecure guys following them around. But once they meet solid guys, they don't know how to be. Cause this guy can get a lot of women and oh my God, what if he rejects me? And they go through the same thing. Um, it's a powerful and realization. About, and you think about an older guy that has a belief that is this creepy or something's wrong, or this isn't reasonable to talk to a younger woman that um, it doesn't, the lens is all screwed up. He is getting, He's getting triggered by a woman who is outwardly attractive. Maybe that's all he knows. Does he know anything else besides outwardly attractive? Yeah. And yet these outwardly attractive, younger, sexy, that's all you know. That's all you know. And so I was like a few months ago, I, I, I walked up. I was really, I saw this fucking sexy yoga girl. And I walked up to her and just said, to God, I just, the color of your lipstick is just knocking me out. And Jesus. And I was nervous. And she was giving me this kind of yo cooler than you yogini energy, which fucking drives me crazy. And uh, I realized as she was putting on her little yogini show, I don't really, okay, I'll, I'll talk to, to you. I just started laughing and realized, what the hell can a 21, 21 year old yoga girl? teach me about anything. I just had this huge realization. I'm 64 years old. I'm, I'm, she should be lucky to be with me. Yeah. I had this moment of just like, it just, just totally the script got flipped in my head as I was watching her pride. That's the key that solid men that so many guys miss that solid men aren't just trying to pass that they aren't, they aren't saying, I got to impress the girl as much as, and they aren't saying I got to focus on passing her tests. They say, I'm going to start testing her now. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, you're going to give me a test. I'll give you a test right back. When you're done, when we're done with this shit, we can have a real conversation. Otherwise you're too immature for me to hang out with. There's a whole attitude change with a solid guy. Yeah. Um, Zan has that comment. What does he say when, when young girls start flirting with him? What does he say? He has a comment about that. Um, I don't remember. Something to the effect of look at, 
uh, how old are you? Oh my God, well, you're, you're so young. What are you, what, what am I gonna do with you? Like, like, look at me, I'm like, what am I gonna do with you? Come on, like, really, you're, you're like a baby, you're too young. And he starts rejecting them on the basis of them immediately. Oh, no, no, you're sexy, but you're, 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 yeah, you're way too young. You know, what, what would I do with you anyways? We, we, we don't probably don't have anything in common. And, yeah. You know, and almost implying that he'd be bored with her. Yeah. It has this interesting effect. Um, yeah, but so what about older guys? Uh, I mean, the fact that we, older, have a wealth of experiences, of, uh, have, a, have a, a, a wealth of, a, of, of emotional of, of, uh, availability to us. And w because we are, uh, as one guy, I saw a beautiful video called it, we are men of status. Now, how do you as an older guy understand, find the lens that you are a person of status by virtue of the fact that you have, you've been on the planet, you've experienced things. It's one thing to tell a guy that, but how does he embody that? It's a good question. And I would say by getting around other men that already feel that way and watching videos of them, getting in workshops with them, being around them, starting to see that women often, if they don't work on their, if they don't work on themselves, let's say a woman doesn't work on herself. She doesn't do a lot of work on herself, on her self-esteem, her personal power. She gets older. She doesn't stay in her feminine. She quickly loses her attractiveness. She's her value is when she's in her twenties. I've had girls say this to me. This is my prime time right now. I have to work it. So they're out there working it for as much as they get. Cause they know that in a short period of time, it's going to change. Now, I don't find that to be true with women. I find that to be true with insecure women that don't stand, that, or women that avoid their femininity as they get older, that start to see themselves as, but, but and that's where the bulk, guys are the opposite. Guys, when they're younger, are often perceived as immature. And this is how I see it, literally, as he doesn't have enough worldly experience. But as we get older, we become very valuable. And we start to get more and more valuable. That doesn't necessarily mean that's true. There's because that, there's a lot of guys that don't that don't work on themselves, don't grow themselves. But if you're a guy that ages like fine wine, as people say, which is what men are supposed to do, then you become ultimately sexy, not just to older women, but to young women too. You become sexy to all women because now you are this rooted rock with experience, and that's just the way it is. And I know that. And as my friend said, who um, at, was 58 at the time, and he's in his 60s now, he's ma he married at 58 a 19-year-old, and they've been married for about five years now. Um, still married, still doing great. Um, he said to me, um, and we all thought it was crazy, like 58, 19, come on, really? And he's, <laughs> he's still doing good. Um, but he said to me, he goes, you know, the one thing I know, because he was always, he's always had a lot of women in his life, he says, as a man, I know I can be dating amazing women, beautiful women into my 70s and 80s. Easy. And right. he says, that's one yeah. thing I know as a man. And he says, there'll always be women. And I thought, it's an interesting way to look at it. And, and that's his belief and his mindset. And he firmly believes it. You know, to him, meeting a girl, why wouldn't I be able to meet a girl? I don't care what age I am. I, that's the way it works. That's a powerful come from for him. Now, I'm not saying that women can't do that. I've actually seen women do that too. It's problem is, is that in society, women don't believe that. When you look at a woman like Hattie out in New York, who's famous, she's been on all these interviews, 80 years old, dating young guys like crazy. She gets on Tinder and hooks up with all these young guys and she loves it. She goes, I love that. She, the way she stays in her feminine and she works out and she flows. And there's all these guys that want to date an older woman. One guy wrote it on here. And so we can all... Once we start to embody the beliefs and live out the energy of a person that is attractive to the type of person we want to be attracted to, they start to show up. It's just the way it's law, cause and effect. Um, I love that. That's really powerful. Yeah. And you and I have talked about that we, you and I aren't interested in younger women. You and I both spark to younger energy. Yeah. And that goes back to who do you hang out with? Are you hanging out in front of the barbershop with the old fogies complaining about, uh, about the, you know, the news and politics? 
are you out there with the younger people and feeling the energy of them and, and feeling what they're interested in? And how is that opening you up? And yeah, an older, I met that woman in LA the last trip down who was, she was in her forties, but God, she was free. She was open. She's so sexy. Uh, it had nothing to do with her age. It's like, I don't see age. I see, I respond to energy, which is what they're responding to too. Very much so. And then they, 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 that's what we all, you know, no matter what we say, that's what we do. I don't want to hang out with like other guys that are, cool, uh, that are like in their twenties that act like old men either. Mm -hmm. or, or girls that act like old and, oh, my life's rough or thirties. I'm like, why would I want to hang out with you? I'd rather hang out with Sam. You know, he's, he's young at heart and that's, that's what matters. Um, so let's, let's get to some of these questions. Um, um, and I want to jump to this guy, Josh. He's been, he's been commenting in the wrong set. He's been asking questions and not in the Q and a, but he's, he's asking questions. And I just want to, he, he wrote two questions on here. Um, I'm 57 and haven't had much luck since COVID-19 came along. Online seems to be nothing but a time suck. I think 90% of men are competing for the decent looking women or they aren't interested in div a divorce guy with two kids. Uh, not simple enough. And then he says, how do you, how do you date in this COVID-19 time? You know, he wrote another one. What are older guys doing now to meet women online coffee shops, just waiting to pet for, uh, for post COVID-19. I mean, first off COVID-19 is going to last it's a, a month or two. It's not a, it's not a, it's not a life. It's not a permanent thing. That's, that's first. But what would you say to that? I don't, I, I, I don't use um, online dating very much, but I certainly know that uh, if you women do not swipe on every guy and men tend to swipe on every girl. So I don't, I, it's a hard question to ask because I don't know what your photos look like or how grounded you are or how, how you're representing yourself. Um, it is a crapshoot. It's fun, but if you look at it, it's a time suck because you're putting importance on it. Yeah, I'll say this about online dating. I sucked at it at first. Um, couldn't get any matches on Tinder, stuff like that. And I realized, I always thought it was, you know, all women are just blah, blah, blah. And then I came to the realization from talking to guys that are more solid that women are emotional creatures. And when they look at your Tinder pictures or any of your profile pictures, they're trying to put a story together about you. And most guys are terrible at putting a story together. Mm -hmm. They post stuff on there that makes them look bad, crappy, uh, whatever. And then they don't understand why the women don't swipe. Whereas guys will swipe on almost every girl. We do that. On, some guys literally have that practice on Tinder. I'm going to say yes to every girl. So girls are getting matches all day long. Um, and um, so it is, it's stacked against you in that way. But when you understand that most guys, if you start putting together a, a set of pictures that tells a story about you, that's interesting and intriguing, but leaves mystery. And then maybe a little comment or two in your tender, let's say, and then you could even block your age if you want. It doesn't matter. And you can, You'll, I get matches every day. I was just showing Jonathan, like, I don't really respond to it, but I, I can see the matches that come in and, and, and it, it's interesting. Um, now, what would I have to do to really make them work? That's also important. And this is why online dating is a lot of work because I'd have to sit there and as soon as the match comes in, if you want the best odds of response, you respond immediately. You don't wait a day or two because girls are moment creatures. They swiped on you two days ago. It doesn't mean they're even interested in Tinder two days from now, but in that moment, she's interested. So you got to be on it. Boom, 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 boom. Mm -hmm. It's a bit of work, but guys that understand it can get dates all day long from it. Uh, Tinder, Match, all these sites. And there's a whole art to putting together a whole profile on something like Match, but it can be done. Uh, that's my, one thing. If you really want to get into that, um, and I wouldn't even worry about getting dates per se. I would get out there and match with people all over the world, swipe in another country and practice chatting, practice flirting, practice teasing. If you go to Colombia, you might get a lot more matches than here in the United States. doesn't mean you're going to go out with them, but you can flirt and tease and play. You can get them on online dates online and flirt with them through Skype. And that's great practice too. Don't um, forget with something like Tinder that they are, they are uh, putting a lens of, uh, of, of, of an age group that they think that they're interested in. It's true. So they don't know you. So you're being lumped in with every other 50 plus guy. So it doesn't, in a way, it doesn't let, unless you decide to lower your age, uh, which. Oh, I know a lot of guys have done that. They either, they either block their age. You can pay to do that for like a nominal fee or they just lower their age. Yeah. And then, and I've seen guys literally lower their age. So they, they end up in the algorithm and then, right in the, the profile, they'll say, oh, I'm not actually this age. 
I just did that to, so I could match with more women that I like because I like younger girls. And they say it right in the profile, but then they have great pictures and a great story. So the girls like them anyways. Yeah. Yeah. Um, or you tell them after you get on the phone, oh, yeah, just, just to be, just so you know, I'm not really that age. I just did that. So I, cause I, you know, and then like, okay, cool. You know, if they like you, it's cool. If they don't, who cares? <laughs> <laughs> Well, there's, there's so exactly. many, who cares <laughs> there's so many things you can do guys you know you can uh you you could, you could you could start flirting with girls on on all these sites and you can have all these online dates right that's one way and it's only temporary so it's going to last a while tons of teasing and bantering practice all kinds of stuff you can do in that way you can still wave and say hi to women just walking down the street as you're passing them even if you have to be six feet apart hey what's up how you doing you know you can we do this all the time and and girls i've had girls stop me that i've dated wow you're bold you're confident yep i walk right over and we start talking next thing you know we're on a date that that's happened as the girl i'm seeing right now that's how it happened um so so many ways if you put your energy out there in a young open sort of way girls will be drawn to you like a magnet um in some way shape or form 100 percent. plus it gets if you're an older guy approaching a younger woman and you hide your sexual interest it's a strange energy mm -hmm. You, who is this? Is this nice older man coming to talk to me about where Starbucks is? Or they, but once they can feel your, feel you in a, in a lower in your body, more really present, not hiding your interest, they will generally accept that. It's that in between that they don't know what to do with. It's like the signals are all crisscrossed. Mm -hmm. And it becomes even more, that becomes more important as you get older. Yeah, as learn to be guy hiding your sexual interest. Then you're just like, who's this? What's going on? Why, why is he talking to me? This is great for any guy of any age. Just learn to be clear and direct. And the better and the more grounded, confident, and solid you are being clear and direct, the easier it's going to, your job becomes the easier than the woman's job at a certain point. Um, because you just show up and ground and create a nice container and then she's going to, have to she's gonna get dressed up and flirt and flow and make everything happen and you know it's gonna be it's gonna become an interesting dance um so let's get into these q a questions um um the, i want you to answer the second one and then I'll, I'll come look at this first one i'm attracted to older women um i'm attracted to older women than the women of my age is that healthy what do you have to say <laughs> I just want to, I just think it's a funny question. So. I just think it's a great, I, yeah, it's healthy. <laughs> it's beautiful. Yeah. Are you kidding? An yeah. older woman being approached by some younger guy and because they want to be seen as beautiful and, and young. And uh, I wrote it, by the way, I wrote a medium article about, and I use the words approaching girls in it. And because I say it from the Zan perspective, which is there's an aspect of part of women, the sexual open curious part is girl energy as opposed to the more politically heavy woman energy i got a lot of pushback from women but once they understood that there's a girl yeah. inside of every woman that wants to be seen and wants to be wants to flower to be celebrated that's girl energy yeah i want to bring out that little girl goofy giggly and i want to bring it i want her to bring out the little boy in me sometimes yep a little mischievous boy that's with his hand caught in the cookie jar and you know and I want to have that be those two little kids together sometimes. And I think that's a hundred percent true. I say this guy, whoever uh, anonymous. Yeah. Just see the girl, see the little girl, see not the little girl, but see the girl in them and they will just open up. They'll just blossom for you. And a lot of those women have a lot to teach you about life, about sex, about uh, men. Let them teach you. Mm -hmm. Some of them want to do that. Hey, Ryan, that's probably Ryan Gaines. Um, dating companies advocate when getting started with this work to act as if or fake it till you make it. Or you have to carry that belief that you must be this person first. Even if you can't attract women already, be, do, have versus have, do, be. Um, can you talk about that from your experience with that if you feel this is true and how would you approach this? I get it. I get both sides of that. 
but you're heading down a path of shutting yourself, just shutting down all the juicy parts of yourself if you're pretending to be something that you're not. Um, at a certain level, you can just, once you become more in touch with, with your fear and your, and, your, and your sadness and you're letting it flow and it's becoming opening you up, then at some point you can say, okay, I'm going to put on, I'm going to find that courageous part of me that's going to appear more confident than I am and let that carry you forward. But as the, right off the bat, I think you're, uh, I don't think it's good for you. But at some point you can fake it. What do you think, Brian? Yeah, I think if you're up in um, anger, pride, you can get away with faking it till you make it because you'll, you'll, it's, it's not a huge leap to get up to courage from there. But when you're down in apathy, grief, and fear, and you try to fake it till you make it, you create the uh, social robot, this fake character, fake persona, because that's the only way you know how to fake it till you make it. Hi, I'm confident. I'm Brian. What's your name? Where are you from? And it, it's, it's such a huge leap that that uh it tends to i see guys doing it for years and they only get worse they got to actually take a deeper look at these insecurities and release them till they have enough personal power to fake it till they make it and yeah. and um so you got to know your starting point and your end point and you got to work in balance yeah and the danger of faking it till you make it is that it just solidifies all those lower emotions and compacts them even more yeah it, it does and then and you, you could, I've seen guys that have come into fearless after training in pickup community for like seven, 10 years. And they're, and they're, they talk about it. They're crying. They're worse than when they started. They're stuck. They're rigid in their thinking. And, and then every time I try to share with them uh, a, a, a deeper feeling based way of being, it, they have to challenge it against 10 years of this pickup logic. That's, and it's like, now I got to undo all that shit with them. It's, it's messy. And also we got one of our guys on the call uh, who did a two week uh, approach workshop and a pickup style and he was depressed for two months afterwards. Yeah, that, that can happen. It just, she just had to, in order to do everything that he was told to do with feather boas and the crazy hats and the lines and the openers, uh, he just had to he just probably shut down his entire nervous system in order to get it done and survive. Yeah, you can't be you. You have to be something. You have to create all of this value that has nothing to do with who you are and you're not good enough. So, you know, if that's who you are, that's great. If you love feather boas and painting your nails black and that's awesome because you can now enjoy that and be an expression of that joy. But if you're doing it just to get a girl, I mean, what kind of girls are you going to get? Other phonies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, let's jump back to this first question from Marino. Um, I've been trying to kind of make sense of it here, and I, I think I'm trying to read it while you're talking. I'm trying to keep an ear on you, so I'm just going to read it. Uh, you mentioned to learn to let go of our attachments and surrender. Why the, why the more we resist the stream of life, the more it hurts and the more pain we create for ourselves because we are caught up in our stories about the good past uh, we had or how good things used to be versus accepting reality in the present. For example, in the case of Sam, what steps you took to pick yourself up emotionally and how long it took for you to recover after your divorce. And if you are going through something similar, what would you recommend to us? So it's a, there's a lot of, there's a little bit of a run on here. I was a little confused, but now I'm starting to get it. Um, he's wanting to, yeah. So why he's asking why the more they resist the stream of life does it create uh i guess all this pain and um and how they and and you know how how to get through it fast i guess well yeah i mean the first word that popped up when reading this is that by by resisting the stream of life or what is whether it's something heavy like sadness or grief or your uh, age let's say you say you, your age and since this is the topic at the call yeah. You're 57, like this guy, Josh, and you're, um, you don't think you, you think it's hard to get women. And so it creates all this pain inside of you because you really want to be with somebody. Yeah. Well, that's, that's the friction, the friction between what you want and who you believe yourself to be. It's that friction of those thoughts, which there's no flow in that they rub against each other and that creates a huge amount of pain. Yeah. So the, so how did I pick myself up emotionally? Well, I had to go, I had to go through my shit. 
I, the, yeah, the goal is, is to be free, but uh, I didn't realize how much uh, uh, stuff I had to, the swamp I had to go through in order to, to get there. Yeah. And that's fine. And that's fine. It was hard. And, and I'm, I still have my swamps. I'm, I'm far from enlightened. So how long did it take? It took me, well, it's still, it, there's an answer how long it took because I'm still alive and it's still going on. Does a tree ever stop growing? You know, at some point it, you stop growing when you die. Right. And I, 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 I could argue that your spirit's still growing even after that, you know, just in another form. Um, he asked that about uh, what to do after a divorce. Well, uh, you're showing up on this call. That's something. Of course, we would always recommend coming to an experience and, and going through a little emotional boot camp and find yourself free on the other side. Or, or if you're interested in releasing, come to a releasing workshop. You know, That's right. We have this releasing workshop coming up. We have an online one coming up. Yeah. Uh, that brings me to the next question. Um, and I'm going to say we have an online releasing workshop coming up for those of you that want to understand stuff like energetic modeling and, and things better. Um, and I think it's going to be a powerful experience that so we're not calling it releasing anymore. We're calling it the revealing process. Um, and it's a revealing process masterclass. And we're going to be teaching you guys how to reveal the inner best parts of yourself through, uh, through revealing, uh, recognizing realization and, um, and, uh, revelation. And you're going to understand that it, when you, as you get deeper and deeper into these experiences, you begin to realize and see deeper parts of yourself that are so powerful. So uh, he, this guy asks, um, Utkarsh, I, I don't know if I can probably totally butchering your name. I apologize. Uh, I remember, Brian, I remember you talking about visualizing about women in Romania. You said it was a rainy night and you went out and met two women. And one of them beca became your friend. Uh, actually, both of them. I dated both of them for a while. Um, my question is, how did you uh, visualize a woman? How did you visualize the face? We can visualize the limbs and the torso, but how to visualize a face, which we have never seen. And uh, it sounds like a very analytical person. Um, um, I'm, you know, what I did was I just visualized enjoying getting turned on for opening my heart, falling in love with meeting two beautiful women. And I didn't have to visualize every detail of their face. I just felt them standing in front of me. I felt them around me. I felt their hands clamping to get clutching together. And I, I literally did a process where I took that from my imagination into the 3d physical reality. Like I was modeling them in the physical world and it was beautiful and amazing. And then I just let it go. That's the best example I can give without taking you through a whole process, which we don't have time for today. Um, and that's what we, we do that stuff in the, uh, in, in the revealing process. So if you want to, uh, experience that, I highly recommend you consider joining that webinar. Um, I will be doing some marketing on it in the next few days. So check it out. And I think it's going to be a powerful, powerful experience. We don't usually teach this stuff online for, for a reason. There's a lot of reasons I haven't taught it online in the past. We're going to start doing it because of COVID-19. That could be huge for increasing your dating life, working on your stories around being too old, uh, working on your stories about, about you know, being too young, or whatever they are. I can't date older women. You know, this is where, this is the processes, processes I and the coaches use to literally shift our realities to have these amazing lives that we have now. And, and we've, we've helped with so many clients over the years. So if you want that reality, consider that. Okay. Um, you want to say anything to that? No, I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to that online course. That's, it's a incredible value. Uh, and for these guys, I mean, it's, it'll change your life. It's sort of the core of what we do is, reveal to ourselves what's going on so we know ourselves better and can be free. That's a big part of what it's all about, man. It's just this constant revealing, you know, revealing, 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 and until you get to that, that core of who you are. And even then, then it's expressing back out. You'll reach a point where you've revealed so much beauty that you now just want to give it away to the world and watch how the world gives you at that point. When you start giving to women, not out of need, but just because you love women, you love your life, and you love feeling their energy, you'll have more women until the day you, you can be 90 and women will be around you. So, um, so Gassan, I, I hope I'm saying your name right. Hi, guys. This is a deep question. Oh, here we, we're in for it now. Deep, deep topic. Uh, for me, I hope uh, it's a deep question for me. I hope you both answer it. 
since I was a teenage, my teenager, my mom always tells me, you're, you are like your uncle and your father. You are lazy and don't take risk and you will never succeed in life. And she called me a loser once, although she is old. Uh, she is old. Memory is a really big subconscious problem for me. What should I do? I know it's wrong, but when I fail, which is okay, this thought surfaces. My gut says is that that message was passed on to you far before your teenage years. I think that was only when you remember it, remember it. So that is a great example of a, of, a, of a thought that has shame attached to it, their shame. So then it becomes blame and it gets injected into you, this thought, this thought uh, emotional system. So your first thing you did is bring it up and bring it to the surface by just even writing a question about it. Because now in that moment, you've become the observer of that story rather than, because if you weren't the observer of the story, you wouldn't be asking this question. You would write, I'm a piece of shit. Well, now you make have awareness that, oh, maybe that's something that came from the outside. And what, a, what an awesome first step that is. Great reframe. <laughs> that was the perfect answer, man. Because you, you got to become aware of something before you can shift it. If you're unconscious to the fact that you're a fish in water, you can't do anything about the water. If you've always been in dirty water as a fish, you don't know how to get to clean water. You know, you don't even know what clean water is. So uh, now you got this thought and you can, I, I just practice that thoughts are meant to float. Any thought or belief system, just loosen your relationship with it just by observing it because you can't be the thought and the observer of the thought at the same time. So let it, like, who is it? Muji said, um, your thoughts are like clouds, so be the sky. Yeah. And what's left is a, uh, is, a, is a feeling. What's left is a feeling, and now you can just deal with it. Now you can feel the feeling. So it's not all glued together. So can you take him through the basic, uh, maybe a couple of basic questions for releasing that he can start asking himself? Wow. Yeah. Um, a basic releasing question would be, once you... Once you see the thought as probably untrue, you could just ask yourself, what am I feeling right now? You could ask yourself and, and allow it to expand. Can I feel this even more? Because Remember, we, we spend so much of our life repressing what we're actually feeling, whether consciously or not. And then how big can you get? For me, it's like, where, where else in my body can I feel it? How big can I get it? And when I ask myself, how big can I get this? And then I feel my masculinity, which is, come on, bring it on. How big? I can handle it. How big can it get? How big can my fear get? I can handle this. And then you ask, can I let a little go? A little sliver, just a little bit. It's just this really creative process. Yeah, you're just slowly, you know, you're slowly, you, you can't let anything go that you haven't acknowledged, accepted, or got aware of, got conscious of. But once you do, and then you, your subconscious starts to realize, your nervous system starts to realize you can handle it, like you just described, then you can start letting it go. Whether it's 1% of the time or all at once, you know, you'll, you know, if you can let 1% go, you can let 100% go. It just, even if you have to do it 1% of the time. Uh, read the book, Letting Go, or get on our releasing call, uh, the, the, uh, the Revealing Masterclass, and, um, and that will be really helpful, too, for getting deeper into these principles. Um, Ivan, I really like what Sam said about thoughts that you think consciously and thoughts that come out of nowhere. <clears throat> I was uh, paraphrasing and missed some info, but can Sam repeat and clarify what he said? And happy birthday, Sam. Thanks, Ivan. Uh, first of all, I'd have to remember what I said. Yeah, that's where I'm like, <laughs> we're in flow, man. You have to go back. Uh, and, you wrote that question eleven seventeen. So, yeah, uh, that's uh, you know, I think wisdom, like real, true understanding, isn't even a thought. It's just a feeling that arises out. So we can use our thoughts to try to understand and go, oh, I was this way as a kid, and I'm going to do this. But once you let go of all those thoughts and you, and, you, and, you, and you just feel more, then the right path, the right openness becomes, comes, out of, comes out of nowhere. And it's more like, a, huh, that is my, that's how I, when I have true 
when something really wise comes up, my, my rea reaction isn't elation. Oh, I've just had the spiritual experience. It's more like, huh, wow. And life just gets a little bigger. I don't think I answered your question though. I think it's good enough considering how long ago you, you probably said whatever you said. <laughs> um, okay, this is an interesting question. It's for you, Sam. Um, hi, Brian and Sam. Happy birthday, Sam. There's an interview that Brian did with you on YouTube. In that video, you spoke about how you were having a conversation with Emily. The interaction seemed to be going great, according to you at least. She said she was laughing and responded well. Then uh, responded well. Then Emily said, "You are so manipulative. How did you get rid of this manipulative behavior?" Yeah, I'll read the story in a nutshell. I was doing model work on my second thing, uh, my second uh, workshop, and I was with Emily, and I was feeling pretty good about myself, and I smiled at her, and she smiled, and I laughed, and she laughed, and then I'm thinking, "Hey, I'm shit," and then she looks at me, and she goes, "You are so manipulative." It fucking hurt so much it just an arrow to my chest and it took me i took took me out for a few months but it was a blessing because i knew exactly what she was talking about it was this little show i put on a little way of manipulating people's you know attention around me so how did i get rid of it um awareness uh, i kept showing up uh, for the work uh, because manipulative behavior is only there because I have had some really unresolved stuff really deep inside of me. So the more I was able to let go of all the stuff which was blocking me, the need to manipulate anybody started to just go away. It wasn't a choice, so I'm gonna stop manipulating people. Um, I was really good at it. It was a way I got what I wanted. Now life is showing me there's other ways to get what I desire. Nice. Good answer. Thank you. Um, what's the difference between releasing it and meditation, Sam? God damn, this is a tough one. Uh, it, my first answer is nothing. Because meditation, you can meditate a thousand different ways. So I see my body meditation, what we would call releasing or, or revealing is just a way of meditating on my my physical reality in the moment rather than opposed to cutting myself off into nothingness i think i believe that i just said it yeah everything um, good ultimately so yeah i i do see a difference and i see them as the same it's like a plot polarity right mm -hmm. Meditation, really good meditation is really good welcoming. You're welcoming and allowing, welcoming and allowing. And you're not necessarily actively re re uh, asking for a release. You're just accepting the moment the way it is, which is what a lot, but releasing is going one step further and saying, you know what? I've welcomed this. Can I, can I, can I let it go now? You're literally just asking your body, can I let this go now that I've welcomed it? And a lot of times that's all it takes because the body doesn't, as you get more and more uh, in alignment with the vibration of your body, it'll start releasing what you ask it to release. But then you begin to realize that the act of, when you get really good at it, the act of meditating is releasing and the act of releasing is just being open, which is meditation at the deepest level. So, so um, that's in a nutshell. Um, come to the course if you want to know more. <laughs> Cause then we have hours and hours. We're going to be talking all day on this stuff. So, um, yeah, so I wonder if I should jump around a little bit. Boris wants to know what he can do about his deep shame uh, around approaching women cold. He feels really deep and he has a deep shame. And he's just wondering, should he even be approaching women um, when he feels like this? And, and um, feels weird. It makes me stuck. Uh, let's see. He wrote here, like deep down inside, I feel I'm worthless and should, should be, and shouldn't even be approaching women I like, or should be approaching worthless and should be even approaching a woman I like feels weird. It makes me stuck. I don't know. Um, I'm not sure what his question was right there. It was a little confusing in the middle. So um, maybe the question is, Brian, should he be approaching women with that much shame inside of him? Or shouldn't he wrote shouldn't down here in the next line. Maybe he's thinking he shouldn't be uh, without yeah. much shame. 
I shouldn't be approaching women. Yeah. I'm wondering if he's done highs. Like if he went out and just did highs to everybody and then approached everybody instead of just beautiful women, mix some beautiful women in there and didn't approach to get anywhere, but approached to experience what he's feeling and then just did releasing a lot of releasing on what you're feeling. If that might help a lot, but you need to take action. So like if you walk and did a hundred highs one day, we do, we'll do a hundred highs in a bar just for fun. We'll walk down the street and just wave to people, wave to people across the street, yell hi. We're getting comfortable being seen. And you can do the same thing, Boris. You can, we stop people. I've stopped 80, 100 people in a day. Just, hey, what's up? Quick question. You know, where I'm going to chat with them really quick. You know, and, but the danger too is that you create a story out of your shame. Oh, I have shame. Okay, you don't understand. I have shame. There's like pride around your shame. Or maybe you don't have that much. Maybe you don't have as much as you think you do. Maybe the thought of having shame is creating more shame. Yeah. Yeah. So go and test it out in the real world and, and find out if you have that much shame. It's all an illusion anyways. All these emotions are illusions. They're not real. Um, they're just part of the game. They're part of the video game. And so as soon as you realize it, they become so easy to let go of. Um, okay, next one. If our thoughts and beliefs come from our past experiences, does that mean that we have to gather new experiences for changing our beliefs? You know, I've never heard a phrase that way. Hmm. But Yeah. Absolutely. I, I, get, I got charged up by that. You know, this, um, the new experiences is in the world of uncertainty and unknowns, right? And I read someplace recently uh, that if you, as ba connected to what we were talking about last week about infinite possibilities, infinite possibilities exist only in the unknown. Limited possibilities live in the known. So if you want infinite possibilities, you've got to step through uncertainty and into the unknown. That's where the world completely starts to open up because there are things you've never experienced before. That's true in every avenue of life. Life isn't lived until you're stepping into the unknown. If you're stepping in the same patterns every day, yeah, you need patterns to function, but it, yeah. until you get used to being in the unknown, you're not truly expanding, growing, and living. Yeah. So, um, and the ultimate unknown is going to be death. Um, and when you release your fear of death, then death isn't death, it's birth. It's rebirth and into something greater. Um, now I'm saying woo-woo, huh? <laughs> It happens when we talk, Ryan. Yes, it does. Um, <laughs> Weren't we talking about fucking? <laughs> no, we're talking about spirituality of fucking. <laughs> we're talking about fucking our way to God, right? Yeah. Um, let's take it. Uh, okay. It's, we've been running a long time and we're really having a good conversation. And we've got a lot of questions. So the question I have for you is, do you want me to start picking these? Do you want to pick some? Do we want to go? Uh, do we want to try to do a speed round where you just go bam, 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 bam? What's feeling good to you? Uh, I think a speed round sounds really good. We can we can dive in any even the simplest question. We can end up diving in really deep. But why don't we uh, choose to not go that deep? Less than a, like we'll go for thirty second max a minute in an answer. Thirty second in an answer or something like that. Yeah, I like that. Okay. Uh, hey y'all. Uh, just want a day wow. Uh, okay, I don't know what that means. Thank you for helping me see my self some more through the 21 days i noticed that when i have a girl coming over or the possibility of a one-on-one -on -one with a female my body starts going either overheating or cold getting tired out of nowhere and just out of out of it how would you deal with this because i want connection sex and and the whole thing i find myself sometimes backing off from the girls out of fear well this the answer is in everything we've been talking about so I'm not really sure how to make it specific. What do you think, Brian? To well, he's got to welcome all those feelings. He's, yeah. he's obviously resisting thinking about them. I would actually journal the feelings, not the logic. What am I feeling after a girl comes over, even before? And just start to develop a certain level of awareness. Because if you don't have awareness, and you, then you can't meditate on it, then you can't release it. So the first step is always awareness. And right now, you, you've got some awareness, obviously, but it seems analytical. So did you want to comment more on that? No, I, I, that's exactly right. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you got awareness the first thing because right now you're asking to fix something that is you can try to fix it. It's just going to make it. You know, we're and we're asking you to welcome it instead of fixing it. Just welcome it and, and realize the the key here is you can handle it and you got to come to that realization. You can handle these feelings. 
Um, and then they'll change. Uh, can you suggest a genuine website for dating women from Romania or Eastern Europe? No, I, I mean, you could literally all, you can go on Tinder and just swipe in Eastern Europe and you can swipe in Ukraine. You can go on any website and indicate that the country. So what are you, what do you want to say? No, I think that's great. <laughs> that's really great. I would do that. I've done that. It's really fun. Tinder has, you can indicate if you, I think you might have to pay a little extra for it, but you can indicate the country you want to swipe in. I think they've just opened it up because of COVID-19, but it's, oh, it's now free. There you go, guys. You guys can be swiping and talking with girls all around the world and setting up even virtual dates online with girls all around the world. And if, even if you don't end up dating them for real, you get tons of practice. Because um, people are bored at home. They want to talk to somebody. Um, I'm 49 and I still have a fear of being judged. This is Brian. Um, uh, judged for talking to younger women. I just uh, like women in their 20s and 30s because I'm young at heart. That's That's not a question. Question. Doesn't think, not a question, but um, fear of being judged is something to be present to and realize that the only judgment out there that's happening is your judgment of yourself. It's funny. Me and Sam will go out together and we'll go to like the grocery store and we'll pick out girls to go hit on and flirt with and and all kinds of stuff. And um, what happens? Maybe have we ever been? Has either of us ever been told we're too old? No. No, oh, they light up. They, the energy is right. They're, they're delighted. They lean or, in. Or they lean in. Yeah. They stop you and ask you for your phone number. That happened. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I look like Stanley Tucci. Yeah. So, uh, so there you go, buddy. Uh, Daniel. Um, hi, Sam. If you are a known person in your uh, professional in a in a professional field. Yes. His name is Stanley, Stanley Tucci. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with anxiety? Uh, that one, you will lose being, uh, idle in her eyes if she gets to know you. Um, and that you think she went out with you just because she respects and looks up to you, but not really likes you. Wow. Uh, that there's, um, the question really has nothing to do with being a known profession in this field, because even if you're a known professional in your field or you're a billionaire or you had all these cars, you'd still have the same question as how would she know if she, mm -hmm. likes, she actually likes me? Yep. So um, it really is the question is how much do you value yourself? Even if you didn't have your good standing in your profession, and this is also a self-esteem question, right? Because if he really loved himself and thought he was really at the point where he thought he was awesome, would this even be a question? Why wouldn't she like me? It's like the natural that goes out to a bar. Well, why wouldn't girls like me? I'm male. I'm attractive. I'm a guy. It's the way it works. Uh, I know I'm attracted to women. So why wouldn't she like me after she gets to know the, 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 the deeper me? And so you're, there's a part of you concerned about the deeper you not being interesting enough. So I would take a deeper look at that and work on that. Yeah. Okay. Have you ever had a guy come uh, to your events who you couldn't get to interact well with women? Sure. Yeah. But it depends on what interacting well with women is. If they finally, for the first time after a two and a half day experience and they ended up, uh, awkwardly asking directions to a woman and she didn't slap him and he just realized that was that that's as far as he could go in that journey it's rare that they don't get past that but um yeah it depends what well with women is some guys will go i did the experience and i didn't get laid well did you not do well you learned everything up to that point so some guys will go out and they they, they literally think uh, they literally have no experience with women at all. They barely talk to women in their life. They're virgins. And so, yeah, so getting, stopping some girls on the street and flirting with them is huge for them. Other guys go on dates all the time and they get a different. So it depends on where they start. Some guys start out and they have no skill. They're virgin. I had one client go from a virgin, his first workshop, he sucked balls. I mean, I'm going to say it that way because that's what happened. He was terrible. He kept working on it and um, he ended up becoming um, a sex coach. 
ended up dating tons of women, ended up da- um, going to swingers parties, ended up, he went from a virgin at 28 to by his early 30s, he, he'd had sex with nine women in one night. Not that that's a, a major accomplishment because I don't think that's for everybody. But the point is, is, is how long are, how, are you going to stick with it? How many stories do you have? How, how, how thick is your critical factor? Are you resistant? We, this is the stuff we are professionals are breaking down. The key is, are you committed? Do you trust yourself? Are you going to follow through? And if you don't trust yourself and you're not going to follow through, we can't help you. So um, thoughts on monogamy. Um, to me, it seems kind of clingy and possessive. What do you got on that, Sam? Well, I'm looking at the one about what do you think of marriage? Is that the one you're looking at? That was the next no, one. I jumped up uh, down because I, I have to go back up. It's way down. Uh, it's just he just wrote thoughts on monogamy here we go well well then let me i'll I'll answer both questions with one because this one i'm looking at is what do you guys think about marriage i feel like if i decide to get married one day i will give up all the girls i can meet and hook up with is marriage a sacrifice of your dating life well the concept of marriage is is a is a concept and uh depends on whatever culture you're brought up with um uh, it, it can be very limiting. You can make up whatever life you want. You can be polyamorous. So you can you, maybe you'll meet somebody and go, "No, I really want to dig in deep and stay with this one person." So marriage doesn't have to be anything that you, that somebody else decides for you. Um, uh, you create what you want to create, and find a woman who matches that. Because if she doesn't match that, then marriage or not, it's your. You're, so you're not going to be aligned. And there's plenty of women of every type. There's women that want poly relationships. There's women that want open relationships. There's women that want swinger relationships. And there's women that want monogamy. And there's women that want, you know, all kinds of stuff. So just like you said, be a vibrational match to the women that want what you want. Um, uh, any thoughts of you dating younger, uh, older, mm-hmm. younger guys dating older women? We covered that. Mm-hmm. Uh, 33, spent eight years taking care of my mom. She died a year and a half ago. I'm sorry to hear that, Tom. Uh, I am new to dating again. How do I get back in the game with, with not a lot of experience dating? Well, I'd go back to what you're saying. Go out and say hello to people you don't know. Start expanding your life. Go around. We do indirect approaches. Make a commitment to go out five times a day and ask women what time it is. And yeah. feel and appreciate them. And, and be curious about what might be next or what the next question is. Uh, compliment them. I'll just say crack, crack the door open. open in a question. Well, don't you agree? Because what aspect? Of, so I would say to you, it may seem like a direct question, but to us, there's like, there's so many aspects to this question that we could go in. So get on the YouTube channel and devour all the videos. Yep. And, um, and, and there's all this, there's tons of questions will be answered in there. Get on to take some, um, some of our online, take a, uh, we're about to offer a special on the online experience program. That'll teach you tons of stuff take it. It's going to be a really good deal. Um, it's not up yet. It'll be up in a few days. Um, consider taking a live experience after this is all over. Uh, if you can do that, um, these are the things that, you know, you got, you gotta, you gotta get, you gotta understand what you, we got, you know, what aspect of dating are you even good or bad at? There's so many aspects. So. And if you guys want to, uh, here, I'll put my email address and if you guys want to reach out and know more and, and uh, connect with me, I can, we can go from wherever you want to go, fill out some of these questions. So yes, the last call. So here's my email address. Awesome. How do you deal with the story that you're going to lose her coming up a lot? Mm-hmm. That's a, that's textbook abandonment. Yep. That's a sense of abandonment that you were carrying in your body even before you met her. True happiness and love is being able to set someone to have the freedom for people to live their own lives and um, trying to control her or prevent her leaving you is, um, is a uh, wasted energy and it won't allow things to blossom where they, where they really could blossom. I agree. There you go. Um, yeah, do do a lot of abandonment work. 
the date and point release. Um, uh, let's see. When I get a, a girl interested in me, I put pressure on myself that I have to get it right. And so game over. What should I do? <laughs> get it right. Well, isn't that the venture of life is getting of, of screwing things up? Mm hmm failing your failing your way to someplace making every mistake you can that's when life gets really juicy go out and make some mistakes go out and purposely make mistakes see what happens i'm going to give you an assignment okay uh rajarish rajarishi and anybody that has this problem to go do it for the net for, go out uh get online since you can't go out but i want you to do this when we, when you can go out and get rejected i want you to collect between now and the next call, which will probably be sometime this week, I want you to collect at least 20 rejections online. And if you're online, you could easily collect 50. Like go on, on Tinder and, and see if you can figure out a way to get rejected. Figure out, say things that get rejected. You don't have to be rude. Just say things that you think. Uh, to, to be outrageous. Be crazy. Don't be boring. Just what this will probably get me rejected. You know, you have really sexy ass. I think you look amazing in that in that skirt. Uh, that'll get me rejected. You know, do that type of stuff. And I want you to collect the literal rejections. Um, and just, and then I want you to get used to them and laugh. And, and then I want you to take each rejection, and figure out how you can laugh at it. And when things, or if you can open up and do it with a friend and make it a competition, I've done um, that before. So you can collect uh, 10 rejections. Actually create a Facebook post on the, on the, on the page about it and I'll do it together. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so perfect. Daniel. Hey buddy. Another one. I teach music a lot. If I have a very young, beautiful student that I am sexually attracted to, it doesn't mean I will hit on her. Of course. How do I stay congruent and not hide what I feel? Weird situation. Why don't you take that Brian? I'm catching up with it here. Well, it's, it's an interesting question because, um, there's no congruency that at that point, She's in a student, you know, if I'm a, if I'm a teacher and I have a student, I'm mm -hmm. not going to show any sexual attraction to her, even if I am attracted. So congruent is that uh, the only way I'd stay congruent is to acknowledge it within myself. Yeah. I feel sexually attracted to her and I'm, I can handle my own emotions. So it's, it's no big deal. Yeah. I can let it be. I don't have to announce it to her. I don't have to announce it to the world. Yeah. I'm sexually attracted to her. So what? I'll let it go now and, and be her teacher because yeah. that's, that's your job. Um, that's how I see it. Uh, you want me to go on? Or you want to say anything? Nope. There's just some. There's his own shame that has nothing to do with appropriate or inappropriate in the world. So it's just that's what he's digging into. There we go. Oh, it popped back to the top again. So, Brian. Yeah. Um, there's a ton of resources that we have. Also, uh, we did. Uh, we have another Facebook group called the Seven Day Challenge for the guys that don't know where to start. Anthony put together like a seven day challenge. Um, uh, when all this pandemic goes away that you can uh, access and really start working on your confidence as well. So that's another resource yeah. that we have. We have fair. Uh, so seven day challenge is great for guys that want to get started approaching women. Um, now, if you're having trouble communicating with women, they'll, they'll do a little bit of that in there too. So there's just different resources. Check them all out and figure out what resonates with you. Um, and how will they find that one? It's called the seven day, uh, seven day approach. Oh, we'll do it in the, um, in the chat really quick. You still there, Jonathan? Yeah, I'll type it in. Awesome. Thanks, buddy. Um, I'm not exactly an older guy. I'm only 30, but my wisdom is beyond my peers. I can hang, hang and have fun, but I don't find much fulfillment and can't really build a connection beyond how they look. So it dies. How can I learn to appreciate them for more than their physical appearance? Well, I'll just say it. There is a. Sam, so do it. this is why I really want you to answer this. There's a ton of pride in this question, which is I am beyond them. Uh, of course, it dies when you see yourself as. Uh, I just have a feeling there's something underneath the pride that is pulling, that is a disconnect from, from other people. Happens a lot with guys with pride, don't you think? Brian, I'm above yeah. you. Uh, so there is a natural, you've already, you're, you've disconnected from them before you've connected with them. 
how can they feel you? Pride is win lose. So there has to be a winner and a loser. I'm going to be the winner or I'm going to be the loser, whichever you're addicted to. So can you let go of the pride and can you drop into I me? Mean, one of the huge uh, realizations I came with is that I could, no matter who I, even if I was dating a woman, even if I was just dating a woman or, 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 or meeting her on the street or anything in between, could I find some part of me that can fall in love with her? Without strings, without, boy, that just changed everything for me. Wow, why don't I just fall in love with her eyebrows? Just, and just find one thing and, and maybe that will crack you open. Nice. And that's it. And you could literally just do a sit at a, uh, like third street promenade a mall where women drop by and you can sit with a, journal, a gratitude journal and practice every day. Who can I be grateful for? And even the women you would least expect, what can I be grateful for from her? What can I be grateful for with her until it starts to come up in you naturally more and more. You might have to do that for several weeks to get through all that pride. Um, how can I incorporate touch when talking to a girl? What's a good time for it? How do I get it just right? Oh, we had a great talk about this once. Uh, uh, touch is just communication, right? It's just a natural form of you. If you make a point, you touch someone on the knee. Uh, so just make touching people part of your world because there's nothing wrong or right right now. With, you know, social distancing is one thing, but. I remember Zan talking about this once, Brian, about how he, women don't even, they don't notice him touching them, but they do. It's light, it's not pulling, there's no pulling. It's just touching, just here, look over here. Look, look I wanna share this with you. Just his hands are moving and he's just touching. Yeah. But there's no, there's no attachment to outcome. If you start touching women, wanting something from them, they're gonna, take a big step back. I think that's super true. Yeah. If you, if you, as soon as you relax, they'll relax. You can, it's touches. It can be almost immediate, you know, um, yeah. it's not the only reason it's difficult is because you're, you you have a story about it. So you got to look at that story and really enjoy touching people. Um, let's go to Ike here. Um, I have a problem meeting women. I, I have no problem meeting women online, but I've stopped doing that because uh, I was using it as an excuse not to approach women. That's kind of why I stopped years ago. I stopped looking at Tinder. Uh, I look at it now because it's kind of fun just to flirt with people right now while we're stuck in COVID. Um, uh, in fact, like I like meeting women out and in the world better, but I don't have the balls I once did in my 20s. I'm 45 now. What is the mindset that you have when you're approaching a woman in public that you're attracted to that enables you to do it successfully? I have this year of being creepy or annoying. I love this question because I, you know, it's just, it's awesome. We were doing all this approach stuff, you know, with the approach workshop. And once you go through all your creepy stories and let them go, cause you gotta, you gotta stir them up and you're gonna feel like shit. And once you let them go, it just becomes fun. It's just, you're just saying hi to people. It's not even beautiful women, beautiful women too. But it's like, look how sexy she is. What's she like? Or look at that interesting person over there. What's they like? Or what's interesting about this person in front of me? As soon as you actually start getting genuine interest, whether they're hot or, or semi-hot or they're somebody, just somebody in general that's got a cool hat or a cool, it just becomes so easy. Yeah, if you spend a day just walking around with, with pure curiosity about the world and then you are actively curious about that, because curiosity isn't pulling energy, it's not pushing, it's just, well, where'd you get that? Who are you? It's the who are you energy of the world, which you want to tap into. Yeah, I agree. We, and that's what the approach immersion is about. We have an approach immersion where we take guys out that have a lot of stories about approaching, and we just take them through it. And they usually often will get emotional, they'll get sick for a while. And what's happening is all their stories about being creepy, weird, or being stirred up during this process that we take them through over, over days. And then as soon as it all lets go, it's like, oh, hi. And this lightness comes out of them and the whole world changes their reaction to them. But they have to release all that garbage. It's the approach isn't one of those things. It doesn't just typically, oh, I decided, you know, I'm a little, it doesn't just typically let go instantly. There's a process of internal emotional detoxification that happens. So if you're looking for a quick technique, it probably won't happen unless you're closer to the answer than you think. Mm -hmm. Um, I feel complete apathy towards women. What should I do? <laughs> uh, that's, a, that's, that's like, 
Yeah, do you got to do all the work, man? You got to get in workshops, seminars. You got to do, do meditation. You got to, you know, you could look out if you if you think you need a therapist, get a therapist. You got to do the work. There's no one answer. What What do you want to say? I uh, know you you just got to be the observer of your apathy first. It's awareness. Of what's be curious about what's inside your apathy. Yep. Consider the release. What do you, uh, what do you not want to feel? Yeah. Consider the uh, revealing pr process that's coming up and consider reading Hawkins book, uh, letting go too. Okay. We're pushing this call to two hours because we're, we're trying to get through all the questions and we, we have fun doing it. So if you feel the energy, um, let's get to call in here. Uh, would you suggest faking it till you make it uh, when you're in, where do you have this question? When you're in pride in any, uh, when you're uh, in anger and pride, or would you try to be in cap? is trying to get up into cap before approaching different from state bumping. How we answer that, which is, yeah, if you're, if you're uh, up in anger and pride, then faking it is probably your, cause you're so close. Yeah. Like, that exactly. Work. The energy that you need to lift you up and, and up, up and out. But also if you're in anger and pride, you can probably with a little bit of meditation, move right up to courage. And if you can do that easily, if you have the access to that, do that first and then go out and approach. And then if you go down, go stop and do it again. And then uh, you'll probably get there faster. Uh, that's my guess. So without meeting you, um, I want to get to the point I'm turned on by and enjoy women. Right now, I feel completely apathetic to what we just had this question. What should I do? Guy, That's the same guy that wrote it too. It's a weird answer. Um, hey, Sam. Brian, one of my biggest fears points I'm stuck at is the fear of getting cheated on. I'm pretty sure I was cheated on uh, before. It's also so prevalent in the media and a huge I accept uh, acceptance of it now. It's prevalent in the media, well, day to day, basically, that I am losing my faith in women being faithful. How can I get over the fear and attract the right type of woman for me? End goal being to build a family. Wow. Can I chime in on this one? Yeah, Anthony, go. This is something that's been definitely come up for me in the last couple of months, especially having a girlfriend, man. And what I start to realize is you got to stop looking at things that have to do with cheating because you're kind of in a weird way, you're kind of validating your women saying these things. The more you see people cheating or hear about people cheating, and your mind starts to become more realistic. And if it becomes more realistic, you start to kind of manifest that world. So what I did was I just completely stopped watching things that had to do with that topic. And what I started to see was that my girlfriend was very loving and all those thoughts that I had about that were just insecurities that I had in general carried from the past and they weren't true. So that's my take on it. I feel like it was most relevant to me right now. That's awesome. Yeah. It's like abandonment stuff and you got to be willing to trust the world you got to be willing to have your heart broken in order to, to create the kind of uh, relationship that you really want. Yeah, that's what Carl used to say to me all the time. You got to be willing to have your heart broken wide open to truly experience love. If you're not willing to, you'll, you'll, you'll always protect your heart if you're scared of, of being hurt. And then if you won't open your heart, you can't experience full love. Okay. Um, I'm more able to consciously connect to my heart and my pelvis when I'm, by myself however when i talk to women i find myself back up into my head and i'm afraid to connect back to my body what possible steps can i take to overcome that's very common very common i was thinking the same thing happens to me sure yeah. the more you are the more you are in the presence of women whether it's just an indirect approach or saying hello you can feel your energy go up well then just invite it back down in the moment over and over again feel your feet on the ground your legs Repetition. That's what you got to do. You got to do it. It's, it's over and over, man. You just do it over and over. Stand out near women in bars and practice coming back down or in a coffee yeah. shops and sit down at the table next to them and come back down. And, you know, it's just a, it's, it's 1% at a time. Don't look for a big gain. Get 1% better at it every day. And in no time, it'll be awesome. Um, those big gains, you guys chasing those big gains, that, you know, that's why you never get them. Um, Okay. Um, whenever I see a girl that I would like to approach, I have noticed that I'll start thinking about what I like about the girl. 
then I freeze up and get cold feet and forget about going up to her. What are your <laughs> thoughts on this? Did you, do you actually forget about talking to her or do you just choose not to? <laughs> I think that's funny. Um, I just say, you know, this is where mystery got it right. Whenever you're brand new and you see a girl you like, I, within three seconds, be moving towards her and talk to her. Don't let the habit of anxiety build up in your body at all till you get comfortable with approaching. And then you can take your time and flirt from a distance. From the beginning, you need tons and tons. And, uh, and you need to approach everybody, not just the beautiful girl. Talk to everybody all the time. Three seconds go, three seconds go, three seconds. So you start to relax. The first key to getting good with women is not getting good at talking to them. It's getting good at relaxing while talking to them. Then you can start working on skill sets. But if you can't relax, there's no skill sets to work on. So go, go, go. And we have tons of videos on techniques, on, on uh, progressions for this type of stuff. Um, we even have the online programs that have progressions, um, all kinds of progression. Get on the seven-day challenge. That's another one. So you want to say anything to that? No. Yeah. No, that's what I was thinking too. Um, how can you keep cool when you meet a person, a girl that you think is one in a million? Well, that's the definition of a scarcity mindset. Yeah. Well, you could also have the mindset of absolute abundance where she is just, there are millions. If I'm meeting a girl this awesome right now, God, what kind of, how awesome am I going to meet? A girl next week or tomorrow because it, it, it's just my reality is getting better and better yeah Use your abundance get in the seven day challenge and start talking to a lot of people too um the more you talk to people the better you're going to get um awesome chat guys sam have you ever been to budapest i have i love been to budapest two or three times love that place i found the I found the people very friendly and the women very open nice i did love budapest I liked uh, some of the castles. I liked the, some of the people, but it just overall, I wasn't, mm. yeah, I wasn't into it. Uh, so, yeah. Um, yeah, that's my movie. I'm not sure what he means by that. Um, if you've had a threesome, how did you do it? Was it just living the fearless principles or did you employ other methods, Randall? I have limited experience in threesomes, mostly because I don't really have a threesome desire. I found the whole thing a little confusing and not that sexy. So um, how did I do it? Oh, well, I know I did it. My girl I was seeing, I brought it up to her and she said, let's go find a girl. So we did. There you go. That's the easiest way is to get a girl that's into girls and then go get a threesome with her. Um, uh, it's harder to find two random girls out on, out on, on a night and take them home, although it does happen. Um, so if you can find a girl that's into it, you can go to, you know, I, I'm the first, my first threesome was with a girlfriend. She was really into, wanted to do, be with women. So I took her to a, um, a swingers party that was really high end and, and we ended up being with a girl from there that was just hanging out, uh, you know, a loner. And um, it was awesome. And uh, we had a great time. And she was a really cool chick. My chick was really cool. And we had a great time. Um, now, you got to be a grounded, solid dude. Your girl's got to trust you. She's got to know you're not going to make the other girl more important than her. You're not going to start looking in her eyes and fantasizing about her. So she doesn't have all this trust in you that you can handle all that sexuality and not lose your mind. She probably won't do it with you. So until she knows you're a guy that can handle sex and you're, and you're not, a, not going to... Uh, make her less important than other like she's your number one she, the, the odds of her doing it with you are slim to none unless you're a throwaway guy for her and she just wants to have a threesome like she met you you're cool i want to have a threesome you want to have a threesome i don't but even those girls sometimes don't want you to bring in a new girl and suddenly think that girl's cooler than her that's the big fear the third girl the girl you bring in is, is the toy and so you got to remember that um, so that's just, uh, there's, there's different methods and different ways, depending on people, different types of girls that like threesomes too, and their personality. So it's a big topic. Um, so that, that's just a quick answer. Uh, guy, uh, my trouble is not communicating with women or hitting on women. It's loving women. I'm completely apathetic to them. I suffer at the presence of, uh, attractive women. What should I do? Watch, uh, revealing, releasing videos. That's some of the best seducers in the world, man. They're like that. 
I suffered the presence of an attraction. What should I do? The apathetic part, no. But being loving women and thinking women are amazing is awesome. You know? So. You know, actually, it's really true because that, that, that suffering at the beauty of it all is, can be very attractive. It's one of the most, it's, it's Zan's personality type of seduction. So Zan Perion seduces that way. He's mad yeah. at women, thinks they're amazing, can't get enough of them, wants to be around them all the time. Uh, it's the, it's a consummate seducer. Uh, the apathetic part though is not, they're actually the opposite of apathetic. They're so uh, expressive and you're beautiful. Look at you. Oh my God. And they're completely unattached to outcome to be that way. I'm in love with you. You're beautiful. And and I'm totally unattached to outcome, so I can tell you you're beautiful all day long. And you know I mean it because I get turned on. And you also know I'll probably be gone tomorrow. Um, and it, turn, it has this weird effect on women. Read, um, uh, get the uh, uh, get online or get the book, The Art of Seduction by R uh, Robert Greene. And there's a chapter on the rake, R-A-K-E. Listen to it, read it, play it online. Uh, that's a that's kind of the seducer you're describing right now, except for the apathetic part. Um, uh, read Alabaster Girl by Zam mm -hmm. Um, and see if these resonate with you. Um, I get the feeling if you can release on the apathy, maybe this is the direction you would go in. So check it out. Right. Um, how, so we got two more. We're going to end two, two or three more, and we're going to run through these because we're, we're way over time. We're <laughs> killing this one. Um, how do you deal with not losing control of your anger? I made a few mistakes. Want to take a stab at this, Brian? Yeah, go for it. No, you go ahead. I was okay, I need to take a stab at it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you have to get in touch with your anger. You have to stop making your anger wrong. And people that repress their anger, push it down or make it wrong, lose control of their anger. So when you can start accepting even 1% at a time that you have anger in you and you can start realizing you can handle it and you can practice handling it, whether you're punching a bag, doing some push-ups, but then even want to get beyond that and you want to get to where you can feel it run through your body and then slowly start as you welcome more and more anger through a releasing process, read the chapter on anger and letting go. Then you can start to... Um, by Hawkins, then you can start to um, slowly start converting the anger into courage. You know, as you can handle it more and more, instead of it being me wanting to lash out at the world, it's me wanting to, choosing to work with the world. You know, and that's a really powerful uh, uh, come from. Um, so we're trying to, I'm trying to answer these fast, man. I could give a whole homework assignments, all kinds of stuff. So I'm just going to run through these. We need to finish up. Um, so did you want to say anything to that? No, embodying your anger without, without like, everybody says to pound pillows or scream or shake the wall. Uh, if I just feel my anger and let it fill my body, it starts to transmute into power. And that's the quickest way and starts to burn through a lot of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, you got to get to where you can consciously look at it and realize you can handle it. And that's a little bit at a time. That's the process of that. Um, welcoming up a little, 1%. Another one percent. So a lot of this comes back to the one percent rule. Okay, we got two more questions. One is, uh, "Hi, my biggest fear is the fear of the girl saying nothing, just brushing me off." Um, well, and do you want to say something to that? One uh, that, used to, that used to be my biggest fear too. It's just like standing there with your dick in your hand. Just uh, it's again, it's just repetition. Approach women where they can't say no nothing. Ask some questions. They're not going to say nothing to a question. So um, it's all your energy. It's all energy. Yeah. We do exercises oh, like yeah. this in the week longs, actually, where we have women be rude, say nothing, and you practice grounding them and containing them and having fun anyways. So life transforming. Did you do any of those, Sam? Uh, no. Oh, they're so life transforming. Sometimes we get three girls. We've been lately getting three girls in front of a guy going at him. And at, but the guy's got to be advanced and more grounded. We can't just start with this. But as he gets more grounded and more advanced and gets calmer and learns to have fun for himself, and these worlds start to come at him. He just starts to enjoy himself. Oh, and, yeah, 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 yeah. No, we did that in the, uh, in the week long or the advanced. Yeah. And girls can't like, help. Well, I'm getting attacked from all angles and then it starts becoming fun. Fun. <laughs> and girls will break because they can't, they see you're not breaking and they just, they love it and they get happy and they, they, they stop being, it's like, it's, it's it like changes them yeah. on a fundamental level. 
Um, how would you deal with being afraid to hurt people? Last question. That's a nice guy syndrome 101. Sure is, isn't it? Yeah. We think that we have power over people to hurt them. Um, somehow we are responsible for other people's feelings. Yeah. Yeah. I just say read no more Mr. Nice Guy right now. That's the first thing that comes up. I would too. Yeah. And then go from there. Get it, and check out some of the nice guy videos we have on YouTube. Things like that. Um, where we break it down more. Um, okay. But there's a belief behind that, Brian, that other people can hurt him. Yep. And, um, well, how responsible you want to be for your own internal world. Or if he hurts somebody, he, he, he's, he's a bad person. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay, guys, it was awesome having you. Uh, this is the longest call I think we've done. And, we, and I really wanted to just get, I don't know why I wanted to push this one because it's technically the last call of the three weeks and we did it. And I know we lost some people, but you guys are dedicated. So we still got a good crowd. Love you all. You're all awesome. Sam is awesome. Sam's got the big heart and he's just dedicated to be here with me. Maybe we'll actually put that podcast together, but I don't think we'll run into two hours. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, with that said, guys, make sure to like, subscribe, put some more questions into Facebook. Let's get this thing. Uh, let's get Facebook going. Get onto YouTube and like and subscribe. Make, put the questions in there. It really helps the algorithm. Make sure to share because it helps so much. Uh, to get the word out there. And I love all the comments you guys are putting right now. It's awesome. And, um, and uh, hit that bell notification button on YouTube if you're on there. And that's pretty much it. I think we're out of here. Um, are you good, Sam? Do you need to say anything? And I would just say that, uh, the, you know, I know all these coaches that they're all, you can, if you're a part of that Facebook group, 21 Days of Freedom, reach out to them, ask them questions. Uh, you vibe with somebody. And if it's not me, it's probably Anthony or, or Josh or you. So um, use us and say hi. There you go, guys. These coaches want to be used. So use them. <laughs> you have to the use them. Life. <laughs> Great. Um, and so, uh, again, you guys are awesome. And remember, only the confident really live, and we are out of here. Good night.